Hello, I decided to record a video describing the second assignment uh, because it will make some things clearer and it will also help you to understand why we're doing it. So the main reason why we're doing a second assignment is there are two reasons. One is you will experience a larger project in which you will need to get organized. Uh, otherwise, you will really suffer. It will kind of really be tedious and um, difficult to do it if you don't organize yourself quite well, I mean programmatically. So you need to organize your data structures, you need to organize your program and you need to pay attention to details in such a way that it will not compound the difficulty of you implementing the, the solution. So every single improvement you can make for yourself will be compounded by the amount of different features that you will have to implement. So that's the, the first reason. The second reason is that you will understand a little bit more in depth how programming languages work and um, how they are designed and you know what are the different trade-offs that you sort of expressing in the programming language such that you have certain features. Uh, because you know you, you are in full control over that particular programming language so you can do it the way you want it. So let's let's get to it. Um, every programming language you interpret or compile needs to have some sort of a parser or tokenizer. And because we don't want to deal with this aspect, this aspect is kind of left um, as easy as possible. Uh, we effectively are just using words from the uh, Haskell or you know, any um, white space tokenizer in any programming language that you have such that you can split your input into, into tokens. So just to give you a, a quick demonstration, uh, if I have, let's see. So if I have some sort of input, uh, my input will uh, consist of some tokens. So I will have some input print um, hello world and so on. So this is kind of a, you know, a, a rubbish input. Um, and all those things could mean certain things in a programming language, could mean uh, certain syntactic elements. So for example, if, if you do, um, you know, function uh, hello, and then you give some parameters, and then you give some code block, and then you say, okay, this function returns something, and in A32, all those are sort of elements, right? So each of these characters or symbols uh, form certain um, combinations, and those combinations will mean something in the language. So a, a, a tokenizer is kind of a mechanism for splitting the sequence of symbols into tokens and then the parser takes those um, those tokens and organizes them into kind of a abstract syntax tree or some internal representation of your program. So we don't want to make this kind of complex such that we don't want to follow certain rules of like what constitutes the name and then what constitutes the open parents for parameters and so on. We, we don't want to deal with a kind of a complexity of a normal programming language. So what we do is we basically delimit everything by white space. Um, so the, the white space is the only delimiter of the, of the tokenizer. And then uh, everything else is interpreted or analyzed uh, as is. So to represent a string, we we have to uh, separate the quotes from the from the rest of the string because if we don't, um, so let me just do this again. So if I do this, uh, hello, uh, that's a single token. That's a single token which uh, just happens to start with the opening quote and then uh, hello like this. Hello, Mama, and here we can say Joe. That's a token as well, right? So there is nothing special about um, a, a symbol which is um, uh, double quotes. 
same as there is no some anything special about the print instruction. So for example, if I say Joe print uh, Alice, right? There is nothing intrinsically special about this print. When it is isolated by space, however, so if I say Joe print Alice, then suddenly this print becomes an instruction because it's a known symbol, it's a known instruction in the language, and then the tokenizer will understand this. So same with quotes. Um, so because everything is white space delimited, uh, we don't have semicolons, we don't have uh, braces to delimit things, and so on. We just use white space for separating tokens. Um, so the parser and tokenizer are very trivial. Uh, we just use white space. And what it means is that the language is a little bit um, um, a little bit weird in a sense that, for example, for expressing strings, we need to separate the inside of the string from the quotes because the quotes need to be isolated by space, right? Uh, in a normal programming language, we would not do that. We would have a proper tokenizer and we would understand that the quote is opening something, right? So in a normal programming language, uh, Joe uh, Ellis is not a valid symbol because it has a special symbol inside. Um, and the kind of the parsers and tokenizers will understand that. In our language, that's just as normal as everything else because there is nothing special about the, the quotes. It becomes kind of special if it's uh, separated by white space. All right, so that's, um, it will kind of be easier uh, when we have more examples. Um, then the, uh, let me just quickly check here. Um, so the tokenizer and the parser will generate this sort of abstract syntax tree for you. So by separating everything by white space, you will have the tokens and then you will kind of represent it internally by some form of internal representation. Uh, I will I will show you what, what I've done, but you, you don't have to follow the same thing, but you will need to have some form of internal representation for all your symbols in the language. Um, and also note that normal programming languages, they are quite complex because they usually form this abstract syntax tree, which is really a tree. Uh, in our case, because our programs are very linear and they are operate they operating on the stack, they kind of pretty much just, you know, a linear structure. So the AST in our case is very linear. And personally, I, I just use a list to represent um, the, um, the program and the value stack. So, and then the interpreter uh, will evaluate the nodes of your abstract syntax tree into something meaningful and put it onto the value stack, right? So we have um, two th important uh, concepts here. We have a program, which is, so initially what, what you will have is, let's say I have a list with two numbers. Uh, yeah, let's do something very much simpler. So I have two numbers and I have a plus operation. Um, so this is my program as, as, tech, as string. Right, so it will be um, a string, and then what you need is you need to represent it internally by something. And in my case, I'm re representing integers by v int. So I will have this, and I will have v int two, and I'm representing the program as as I said as a list. So I will actually have a list like this internally in my in my memory. And then I'm representing um, operations as operations. And then I have a particular operation for addition, which is called add. Uh, and that would be uh, my internal program that I would interpret through the interpreter, right? Um, so this is um, the interpreter will interpret the internal representation of the program and the program will be generated by your parser from the text into this type of representation, right? Um, so if I quit that, uh, yes, I don't want to be saving. And if I say stack GHCI and if, so working with the command line um, interpreter, when playing with your implementation will be very helpful. And you should make some of the functions um, 
uh, public such that you can play and test how you know what how it works and what you do uh, it was very helpful when I was doing it so I'm sure it will be helpful for you too so if I say bproc uh, parse and I give it this program that I just showed uh, abo um, above so I have two numbers and a plus operation and I say okay please parse me that program um, it will generate exactly that um, that list um, if there was an error I would get left um, I'm using either for handling errors so bproc parse parses the text into the internal representation and then it will uh, generate the internal representation uh, as a list and it will if there are some errors it would um, it would do uh, a left uh, indicating that there was an error um, you don't see the symbols here you don't see v v int v int and this v op because i'm simplifying the show uh, so i don't want to show all the extra types i kind of re-implemented the show instance for my uh, for my types such that they kind of pretend to be normal haskell types so you know i have uh, normal integers and the, the normal plus indicating this but behind the scene i i know what types those things are and to uh, to show you um that th th those types exist i can say run program and then i cannot pass it this because that would be not understood but if i pass a program which is exactly what i showed you before um all right so i have now a normal haskell list with all my uh, internal representations for this uh, for this program, um, I can run it and it will basically evaluate this addition with those two values on the stack and gives me the the, the answer. Again, if there was a, an error running the program, I would have left. Uh, but if if it works, I, I have um, just the right answer. And of course, I can combine it. Right, so I can say run program. And the program is the result of my bproc parse, and then I can parse this such that, um, yeah, so uh, a run program expects um, a list, and bproc returns an either. Uh, so I can't just simply. Um, run program on top of my either because uh it's a list hidden with the right with the right side of course so i can try i can try this right um so then i i have double rights because i'm kind of uh, doing the applic applicative here but you you see that i have a right from running the program and then I got right from not having errors with the parsing, such that I have no program execution errors and no parsing errors. And the value, the outcome value is this. All right, so anyway, you need the interpreter and you need the representation of the program. And then you need a representation for the value stack. Um, to, to do that, I will actually go into... Um, so, you know, if, if you have this program, one, one, two plus, um, what this program does actually is it evaluates number one and a number one evaluates to itself and it is put on top of the stack. And then it evaluates number two. Again, number two evaluates to itself and is put on top of the stack. So now I have a stack with a number two on top and one uh, footer deeper in, on the stack if, if we represent a stack as a list and the head is the top of the stack so now plus is being evaluated and what plus da, does is if, if we have two and one on the stack plus will pop two items from the stack so it will consume two and one and it will do an, an addition and put the new value on, to, on top of the stack it's exactly the same as with the RPN calculator, right? So it will put three. So you need a, a program and you need this value stack, which is kind of the operand stack of where the results of computations are being put and from where 
the program or the operations take the arguments, right? So let's quit that for a moment. Um, let me have a look here and um, I will, I, I did talk a little bit about the implementation. Um, I will tell you now a little bit about two modes that program can, can work. So if I have, um, so if I run my, um, if I run my bprog interpreter, uh, it basically listens for input from standard input. Um, and if I say one, two plus, and it, it waits until the stream is finished. So I have to control Z or control D, uh, and then it will finish uh, and will print the final result uh, that has been computed and it will quit, right? So I press control D so this control D has been um, um, yeah, printed here. Um, yeah, I have, um, it, it should be end, uh, end of line character. Uh, and then um, the program basically quits. If I run it and I put two values on, values on the stack and I quit it, then I will have an error. Uh, because the program expects that the valid program should finish with a single value on the stack. If there is stack empty or if you have multiple values on the stack, that's an error. Uh, and I'm indicating it here saying, okay, program finish with multiple values on the stack. And I, I print myself additional context of what went wrong. And um, this is the program list. So I don't have any program instructions anymore to do. Uh, and this is the stack. So the two is on top and one is deeper. And that means uh, you have a problem because you can only leave one value on top of the stack. So again, if I do one, two plus and I close it, it prints three and there is no error because it the only value on, on top of the stack is three. Notice that this program quits, like uh, it, it quits after consuming the input and printing the single result. So it's just interpreter, which kind of takes a script or takes the, your input runs it and, and quits. Uh, you can run uh, your program with um, a REPL mode. And what REPL mode is, is you basically enter a read, evaluate, print loop, and you can enter expressions. They will be evaluated line by line and the uh, evaluation will, a result will be printed. So read the line, evaluate it, print the result and loop back, right? Um, so if we do that, I have my interpreter uh, running and I can do the same with plus and it will evaluate this program, print me the result and I can, you know, I can interact with the program again. So I can do, you know, something else and it will, um, it will work. You will notice that it, it produced an error this time. So before I had two values on the stack, and then I did plus. So let me let me uh, restart it again. Uh, so I will restart it, and I I am putting two on top of the stack, and now I'm putting three on top of the stack, and I'm doing a plus operation on the two which I already have on the stack and three which I've added now, and then I end up with five being on top of the stack. But this five on top of the stack doesn't disappear. So it's still there. So if I add another value, if I add another value on top of the stack, now I have two values on the stack. And that represents an error. Like you, I should not have a program with two values on the stack because it should only have one. And this error is kind of indicated by this um, dashes. So the dashes mean I have more than one value on the stack or something went wrong and I am printing myself a stack um, here. So I see that 34 is on top of the stack and then five is a little bit deeper. So now I can do something with those two numbers. I can, you know, multiply them and then I will have one value on the stack. And then I don't have those dashes anymore because I only have one value on the stack. And then if I pop um, this value of the stack, I will have an empty stack and that represents an error again, right? So then again, I have sort of an um, error situation 
um, indicated by those dashes, and then I have an empty stack. So for the REPL, for interacting with the REPL, that's fine. That's kind of a desired behavior because I don't want the program to crash and, and go out of the REPL. I want to be within the REPL, but I want to be within the REPL and do certain things uh, with it. But um, I also need to know if my programs or my kind of instructions, if I write a longer ones, um, finish with without or with an error, right? So this is... Um, this is about the REPL, um, and I, for convenience, I've added here a couple of um, helper things. So, so the input here is just a bprog input, but I have some meta meta inputs which start with the semicolon. Um, so, kind of in my particular implementation, semicolon means a special thing for the for the REPL, such that I can do some meta meta things, and I have four meta things. So b prints me internal variable bindings so we will talk about it in a minute um, s prints me the stack and then q quits and h prints me the, the help so i currently know that i have an empty stack but i can do 30 and i can put a plus quotation on top of the stack um, and what else can we do? We can do different things on, onto the stack and then I can say, okay, show me the stack. And it will show me that, okay, on top of the stack, I have a plus quotation and the number 30. So what I can do is I can put uh, 20 on top of the stack. And now again, I can print myself what the stack is. I sort of see it here, uh, but I also have the ability to see the stack with this um, colon S. And now what I can do is I can um, swap the two, um, two top elements of the stack and then I can execute the quotation. So I have 30, the deepest, 20 plus and then nothing. And I'm putting, I'm kind of evaluating exec now and exec will basically evaluate this quotation with those two values on the stack. We'll add them, it's 50. And then I have a result, which is 50. I can check what's my, my stack and it will also tell me, okay, you have 50 on top of the stack, a single value, right? So literals. Uh, literals in the language are quite simple. We have numbers. So 50, 10, those are integers. We have floats, so I can put uh, a float onto the stack. So now I have a float floating point number and integers. Um, we have strings um, and we have lists. So notice that the lists need the list opening and closing brackets need space because yes, we are space delimiting everything and you don't put commas because uh, space is the delimiter. So uh, space delimits the elements of the list, right? So now I have on top of my stack, I have a list with three numbers, then I have a string, then I have a float, then I have two um, integers. Um, of course, we also have true and false values uh, which are literals for the booleans. Um, I use them with cups uh, such that I can easily do read and show from Haskell and I piggyback on Haskell booleans, of course, um, but you can do whatever you want. So um, this is uh, the literals uh, and I've already showed you some stack operations. So we currently have uh, so many elements on, on the stack, so I can pop uh, multiple elements. Um, so if I do pop three times, I will have hello on, on top of the stack. So then I can do print and I can print the, the hello, um, which will consume it, print it to the console and it will leave those three on top of the stack, right? So let's try that. Uh, and then it, it did that. Um, it printed hello and then printed me the stack because I have this sort of error situation uh, going on. Uh, so if I check, okay, what do I have on the stack? I have uh, those three numbers. Um, then we have simple arithmetic operations, plus, minus, division, and so on. Um, there is a integer division and there is a floating point division. So now you have some choices to make. 
what will happen if I try to integer divide a float with a integer, right? Um, what, what should happen? Uh, should it throw an error or should it somehow work? Uh, you, you make those choices. Um, so it's kind of up to you how you do type coercion and how you deal with type, type system, right? So I have it here, type system, uh, type coercions and type conversions. Um, in my implementation, if you do that, um, yeah, I will put, uh, let's pop, pop. So I have an empty stack. I will do it again. Um, let's have uh, 10, um, let's have 200 divided by 10.0 okay um so then what will happen if i do a integer division with those two with the with the uh, integer and a float um and it basically rounds the float to the nearest integer and treats it as an integer so i'm i'm doing a type coercion uh in such a way that floats are being rounded up to the integer and then integer division will happen so it's the same here so if i do 0.4 divided by 10.4 10 um you know uh, with the integer division um and let's yeah we have to pop the element on the stack we have 20 on the on top of the stack so we just pop it and then we say two. 100.4, 20.4, divide integer division, and then it basically rounds them to the nearest integer and divides them and you know uses the output type as the as the integer. So what will happen if I do the same for um, floating point division? Well, it will basically do the floating point division, right? So it, it properly calculates the division between 200.4 divided by 20.4. Um, what will happen if I use uh, um, non-floating point item in the floating point operation? So, for example, if I try to do 200.4 as a string divided by 20.4. So again, it's it's your choice uh, how you deal with type type system. Uh, so in JavaScript, for example, um, that would be coerced to a number. Uh, yeah, there is a space, unfortunately, so I need to re redo it. Yeah. So I decided to play with this a little bit, and I'm also uh, so there is uh, two items of the stack. So let's do that again. All right. So as you see, this gives exactly the same result as doing this. Right. Um, basically, this this string gets converted to a float and treated as a float. Uh, of course, if you if you do abuse it. So if you say Fred, uh, 10.4 divide, it will say, well, you know, number conversion error, you cannot convert Fred to float, right? So um, that failed, uh, but if that worked, it would be coerced to a float. It's again, kind of up to you. If you don't like this type of coercions, uh, you can basically throw an error already here, or you can try to, to do that. Um, so, this type coercions and type conversions are not specified in bproc. They are kind of up to you to decide how you're gonna, how you want to deal with this. Which is, you know, to some extent a little bit of fun uh, because um, you can uh, try to do certain things in a fun way. So, for example, I have um, type coercion between um, boolean. Of, um, so, you know. Uh, let's see what we have on the stack. We have one number, so let's pop it. Let's put true and false on the stack. Okay, so now I have two values on the stack, true and false, and I will do addition with them. Okay, and the result is one. So, okay, let's pop that from the stack. Let's put true, um, true and true and do plus. 
Well, the answer is two. Um, so the true and false in, in my BPROC are coerced to zero and one, uh, such that true is coerced to one and false is coerced to, to zero. And then you can do arithmetic on your Boolean types. Uh, you know, just for fun, uh, you can do whatever you want in the type system, but you are kind of the master of it. You, you're deciding like how, how, it, how it's going to work. All right, so um, errors, of course, you will have errors. Uh, so as you've seen, uh, for example, for the uh, time coercion, um, float coercion that I was doing, I, I have to kind of print the error when, when it happens. There is a lot of errors. Uh, so for example, you can have an error by opening a list and never closing the list. So, you know, I have an error saying incomplete list uh, because you kind of didn't finish the list. Um, the, there are you know incomplete strings like this for example it also says okay we you, you kind of incom you have incompleted string um if you type a, an, a symbol which doesn't exist in the language it's not an error so if i say hello that's not an error in itself because hello becomes a kind of a, a symbol or variable that is not bound to anything and it just evaluates to a non-bound variable, right? So I have a symbol called hello and it is on top of the stack. So if I check, okay, what do I have on the stack? It says, well, you have one symbol, which is hello. Uh, and those symbols on the stack are useful because there are two uh, operations that you can do with them. Uh, one is the assignment uh, and another one is an evaluation of it. But let's, um, let's scroll to that. So... We have uh, dupe, swap, and pop for stack. That's kind of pretty straightforward. Um, we have two operations for reading a string and printing a string. I really simplified the I.O. Uh, just to two operations, printing and reading. Um, so if I print um, hello world, it will print it. Um, and because I, I already had hello on the on the stack, it will kind of uh, print me the uh, the string that I'm printing here and, and uh, print the final value of, of, on the stack. Um, the, there is a bug. There should be an end of character here su such that it's printed um, on the new line, but that doesn't matter so much here. Uh, and then read. So let's clear what we have on the stack. We have hello. Let's pop that and let's read stuff from the user. So then the user can say, this is a sentence in English. And then this is a string which gets put on top of the stack. So if we say, okay, show me what is on top of the stack, we will have basically just one string, which is what I just entered. Um, and then we have uh, words which splits, same as Haskell, splits the top element on the stack into a list of tokens. So it basically does the tokenization for us. So now you see I have um, a list um, which words produced, and this list is on, on top of the stack. So if I say, okay, what is on the stack? It says, okay, the stack is just one element, which is this list. And then that leads us to list uh, operations. So I can say, what is the head of the list on the stack? And it's this. So that's the, that's this. All right, so arithmetic. Um, we discussed that. Uh, there is um, a funny artifact. So depending on your decisions, um, there might be some interesting um, artifacts that will happen and they will make your language weird same as javascript is weird right so for example um i showed you that i am coercing the numbers to numbers if they are strings so if i say plus uh this string will be coerced to a number and will be added so then i will end up with 25 on top of the stack notice that this is coerced to a float not to an integer right um so I, because this one is an integer, if this one was coerced to an integer, I should have an um, outcome of addition 
being integer, but I actually don't. So one weirdness already is that those are always coerced to floats, not to, to integers. The other weirdness is, so if I pop those two things, uh, is that if I say, okay, is, but knowing that it is an integer, right? So if I say, okay, is this integer and this integer the same, uh, it will say, no, they are not. Because when I'm doing comparison, uh, this thing is not coerced to a number. It is only coerced to a number when it is involved in arithmetic, but not when it's involved in, um, you know, um, comparison. So the comparison will not coerce my strings into numbers, um, which is, you know, you can say, yeah, that's weird, right? Uh, maybe it's inconsistent. Maybe you should make it more consistent, whatever, right? Um, and then we have the, um, the less than and bigger than. Um, again, you may need to, um, so, so as you've noticed, this doesn't work, right? It basically says false. This is not the same as this, but if I say, is this bigger than, than this, it will say it is bigger, right? So for the comparison, Again, strings are, conver are coerced to, to numbers. Um, so let's pop those two things from the stack and let's do one more. So if I uh, say 19.9, um, is it bigger from 20? It will say false, right? So for 20.1, it is bigger, but for this is not. So um, all right, uh, then you have the logical operations um, and and or and not. Um, I implemented not, so of course, uh, okay, let's pop things so we have an empty stack. False not is true, right? Uh, that's obvious. Let's pop that. Um, but what's um, not of 10? Well, it is minus 10. So um, I'm doing not is the same as negation, right? Um, just for uh, for fun. Again, if I do 10 as a string, it will say, well, what are you doing? You can't negate or make not out of the string, right? Um, so this coercion to a, to a number sometimes works, sometimes doesn't. Uh, here it says, I do expect the bool value or number to do this not. So for numbers, it works, and for bools, it works, but for strings, it doesn't. Again, it, choices are yours. So then you have uh, a lot of list operations uh, to do. Those are, um, those are simple, uh, head, tail, empty, and length. Uh, cons versus append. So let's pop, pop st stuff from the stack, we have an empty stack. And what is the difference between cons and append? So what would happen if I say one uh, to append, right? Um, well, it is an error because append expects that the right hand side element is a list. So it cannot append one to two because two is not a list, right? So if I say one, so if I say one and two is a list, and I say append, then it will work. It, um, no, actually it will not work neither because it expects one to be a list as well. So append expects two lists uh, for the left-hand side and for the right-hand side, right? Um, so if, if we do one is a list and two is a list, and then we append the two lists, it will work. Right, so now we have a list which uh, has one and followed by two. Uh, let's pop that. Let's make it uh, a little bit longer, two, three, and then four, five, append, that works. Uh, let's pop this. So now what is cons? So cons, again, let's start with one, two cons. It will not work because cons expects the second argument to be list. Um, so if we say one cons two three, that will work. But if we try one 
and then two and three. What will happen with cons? So what would happen with append? Question to the audience. Well, we would end up with a list which has three elements, one, two, and three. What will happen if we do cons? Well, again, what will happen is we will end up with a list with three elements, but the first element will be a list which has an item inside, which is one. So um, yeah, let's do it again because we had some rubbish there. So it's easier to see if it's just a single value on top of the stack. So you see, um, the difference is that we uh, did cons with this item, but it was treated as a single item and it ended up as an item in our list, right? So again, cons, um, cons is kind of an equivalent to uh, um, semi uh, colon in, in Haskell and append and append is equivalent to this plus plus operation in, in Haskell. All right, um, let's do, what else do we need to do? Um, yeah, so then uh, quotations. So quotations are code blocks that you delimit with the uh, curly braces. So a curly brace um, followed by some instructions. So for example, 10, 20 plus, it's a code block. Uh, and this code block will be put on top of the stack, right? So if I remember that we have on top of the stack, we have this list now. So I will not clean it because, um, and now we have this quotation or this code block on top of the stack and we have the, the other things. Um, and we can execute quotations. So um, quotations have a command. Yeah, let's pop this. So if I put a quotation on the, on the stack, so 20, 30 plus, and then I execute it. If, if I did this, it will put the quotation on the stack. And then if I do this, it will fetch one quotation from the stack and execute it. And it will put the value, the resulting value on top of the stack. So in our case, it will be 50. Um, so I can, um, the, the, the quotations, the code blocks can be sort of like anonymous inner functions, uh, but they can also be like, um, um, they can uh, take, they can take some operands from the actual stack, right? So let's pop this 50 and let's put 20 and 30 on top of the stack. And now let's put a quotation, which is plus. And we have now three things on the stack. This one, which doesn't actually have, doesn't put anything on the stack. It just executes what's already on the stack. And then it, that it will kind of take those two elements and exec and um, add them together. So then we end up with a single value value on, on top of the stack. So you you can see it is uh, like uh, yeah I I forgot the word. Uh, it is um, yeah it will it will come back. Um, so it's it's a um, anonymous function which takes. Um, the context from the from the environment effectively right so you have just proper anonymous functions which produce value uh with without consuming anything from the environment or you have uh ones which are actually consuming arguments from the environment um so the the quotations are kind of useful because you can use them for doing those list operations like for each uh, or for map and for folds. So let's demonstrate that. Um, so if I have a list of, um, let's have a list of um, two strings. So I have a list of two strings and what I will do is I will say for each of those two strings, please parse an integer. So let's convert this, um, uh, this list of two items into two items, which will be put on top on, on, on the stack, right? Um, so now, yeah, there was a 50 left over on the stack, but now I have uh, two and one on, on the stack uh, because I did each. Let's 
pop those uh, three values and let's do it again. So let's have uh, uh, one and two in a list uh, as items of the list. And instead of each, let's do map. So parse integer. So now the difference is that each executes this quotation with each of the items on, on the list and puts the outcomes or results on top of the stack. Uh, map does similar thing. It takes each item from the list, executes this quotation on top of those values, but puts the result into a, another list and then puts the list on top of the stack, right? So now if I check, okay, what's on top of my stack, you will see that it's a list of two items, one and two, not values two and one on top of the stack. Notice also that the, the processing goes from left to right. So parse integer will parse this, put it onto the stack and then parse this and put it on top of the stack. So you end up with the top element being the last one from the list. Whereas uh, with, with map, you just end up with the list in the same order in which the elements were processed. Um, same as Haskell. So the, the map uh, works exactly same as in Haskell. Um, each is a little bit different. It, it kind of works like for each or each in, in, in JavaScript for some iterate, iteratable uh, items. All right, so then we have a fault. So fault, uh, same as in Haskell, they are a little bit more involved. So if I say one, two, three, four, I have four numbers and then I have an accumulator. So I will say my accumulator initially is zero and then I will say fold left and then you put the quotation and the quotation can be simple addition. Um, so now th this quotation needs to be a binary function because it will take the accumulator and elements from the list, exactly same as in, in Haskell. So then I end up with number 10 on top of the stack. Uh, let's pop those two values from the stack and let's do it again on a clean stack. And then it kind of um, folds my list into a single value. Um, you can do um, various things with it. You can parse it, concatenate it, append it, uh, things like this. Um, I had, um, so for example, if you have, um, if I, yeah, now we have 10 on the stack. So let's do, let's uh, pop that and let's put one, two, three, four on top of the, of the stack. Um, so now we will have four values on the stack. Uh, then we will put an empty list and we will call cons, 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 and cons, which will basically construct the list out of those four values, right? Um, so we end up with a list, uh, one, two, three, four, uh, from initially we had five items um, on the stack, one, two, three, four as integers and an empty list. And then we, we did that four times um, and constructed a, a list. So I will pop that from the stack. So let's do it again. Um, and I have an empty list. And, and this time let's, because we need to do this cons four times, right? So let's say four times and then say cons, right? So this is uh, another um, uh, operation which operates on the code blocks. Um, so the code block um, times here. So times takes a number from, from the top of the stack and executes the block number of uh, 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 times, right? So if we do that, again, we basically did the same as here, but without repeating ourselves four times, we said, okay, we need to do four times cons and then it produced exactly the same, the same result. Um, so there are some examples for if. Um, if takes two um, code blocks. So now let's pop that from the stack. So if we put true on top of the stack, or if we do something that results in true, uh, then if we say if, then the first code block is executed when things are true. So we, we can say, um, 
we can say it was true and print this. Uh, and then the second code block is it wasn't true. Print. Right? So if always needs two code blocks following it for true and for false. And then it says it was true uh, because it takes the the tr uh, boolean value from the from the stack. Of course, if you do something stupid here, so if you say uh, hello, hello, if uh, do something for positive and for negative paths, it will say, well, your yeah, hello is not a bool. Uh, if if expects a bool, and you know that will not work. So you do need to handle errors, right? Uh, you need to handle errors somehow, and you need to give meaningful errors to the user. Uh, but how you do it, um, it's a little bit up to you. Um, all right, so we went through most of it. Uh, there are um, two, two things left. So one thing left is the variables. So let's clear the stack. And then you've noticed I have uh, colon B, which prints me the bindings that I have in my language. And the bindings have two operations. One is this, which is kind of like a de define. Uh, they are described uh, described here. It's an assignment. Um, and it takes two arguments. It takes a symbol and a value and assigns a value to a symbol, right? So it's kind of like doing in Golang. It's like doing this in Golang. But because we... Um, Sorry, because we have a concatenative language, we use the reverse Polish notation, then it is basically like this, right? Um, so that will bind. Um, notice that the stack is empty. I didn't left anything on the stack. So what happened was I put a symbol on the stack. I put the number 10 on the stack and then I executed the bindings, uh, the binding. And now if I print the binding, you will notice that I have an H mapped to a number 10. Uh, what it means is that I can, for example, create a list. Uh, remember the stack is empty. So I can create a, a, a list which has number 10 inside, you see? Um, because this variable is bound to this value. Um, so I can use it as a constant now because it, it is kind of always gonna be 10. Uh, wherever I use H, it will be evaluated to number 10. And number 10 evaluates to itself such that it, it is kind of uh, uh, evaluated like this, right? So you can have variables. So you can use variables and then once you define it, you can use it in your program. So for example, you can say h print and it will print 10, right? Um, um, yeah, let's pop from the stack and let's say print h print and it will print 10 and now the stack is empty right i mean we had the leftovers before um so um what will happen if i use a quotation right so let's say i have i pop um so i have 10 10 plus as a quotation and i say i need a symbol on the left hand side so i will say uh plus 20, like it, it, uh, the result is actually 20. I need to swap the, the elements on the stack because uh, the symbol needs to be on the left-hand side and I assign it, right? So it will do it. Uh, if I check my bindings, I will have plus 20 being assigned to this quotation, right? Um, but what will happen if I make a list with plus 20, right? And H, uh, no commas, H. Well, this will get evaluated to, to the quotation and H is going to get evaluated to 10, right? So I have a list now with a quotation and with the number 10. Uh, what if you wanted to get 20 out of this? So instead of plus 20 evaluating to this, you wanted to actually get the execution of this. Um, well, that, that's um, like you, you need additional layer on top of evaluation such that it will evaluate to something else. And that's, uh, you know, called exec, right? So if I pop my things, I don't have anything on the stack. And if I say plus 20 exec, then I will get 20, right? 
So I'm executing the quotation which plus 20 represents. Um, and this pattern is so common because it's called, you know, calling a function that we have a different... Um, um, so if I say new plus 20, and I say, okay, it's the, exactly the same function that I had. Um, but this time, instead of this, I will use a fun keyword. It will map n plus 20 to a function, which is basically this quotation together with exec, <laughs> right? Um, so it's, you know, it's almost exactly the same as before. The difference is that if I now call n plus, so let's pop anything from the stack, n plus 20, it will actually give me 20, not a quotation, but the value out of executing this quotation, right? So the difference between um, plus 20 and n plus 20 is that this one evaluates to the quotation, which it was bound to, and this one evaluates to the execution of the quotation that it was bound to, right? Um, so that's a, a subtle difference between just assignment of a variable to a quotation and assignment of the variable to a quotation with the exec of that quotation embedded in the meaning of this of that of that symbol. Um, so we've used fun from Golang to define the, the functions basically, right? So um all right so that's pretty much it uh then there are the tests uh the tests represent a lot of use cases that uh the language should deal with and they have uh all those different use cases that we kind of discussed and they are basically a copy and paste from my own uh test um uh, harness so if you if you if i run the tests uh they will hopefully pass yep yeah. so i as you can see uh they all are green um i have 101 tests because i have a little bit more uh so if you go to my spec i implemented additional tests before i've implemented those uh for parser and for some of the um while i was developing the the language i i needed to test certain things and i've used this initially and then i converted it to um to this schema i've used a uh, kind of a utility function here um uh, that instead of saying it blah 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 i kind of defined a, a very short function t that basically does this it thing for me and checks whether there was an error or not all those things should not have an errors and those things are testing the proper execution path such that I don't care about the errors. For testing errors, I had those additional tests and I can come up. Uh, so here, for example, I have incomplete string. Uh, so I was parsing some things and I, I expected errors. Uh, so I did have uh, implemented some error checking separately, but I can try to do the same for uh, within this format. Uh, but of course, it will not work for you. Uh, because you will have probably different error types and different uh, error situations such it doesn't make sense. Uh, it does make sense for you to reuse this because um, the behavior, the execution should be exactly the same. And, and all those tests, they don't do any weird stuff. So I'm not coercing, coer doing tests for coercion of um, string values to numbers and things like this. So those are just a plain vanilla idiomatic uh, bproc programs such that they should just work as as expected. Um, all right, so I I went a little bit over time that I intended to, but I went through a number of uh, use cases and a number of uh, patterns that you have to think of, and I gave you some hints of what you can use to implement it. Um, I'm using the OptParse applicative for uh, just doing the REPL thing. So I have this um, stack. Uh, yeah, I can pass. Uh, yeah, let's say help. You will see that I have this uh, printout uh, and it takes this uh, dash R or dash dash REPL 
for um, REPL mode. So uh, it's, it's very trivial. You don't need this uh, library, but it makes it a little bit nice. I'm, I'm using some uh, state T. I can show you um, in the interpreter. I'm using uh, a little bit from the state monad. Uh, actually, the state monad transformer uh, state T. Uh, that is useful for me to evaluate the state of the program. That makes it a little bit more compact. And it will, um, you know, make some of the coding nicer. Uh, so you see here my um, doc tests for interpreting the the program with a run program, um, and I have um, I isolated I/O in such a way that every time I I do print or every time I do read, my program stops. It tells the whoever was executing the program to deal with it and then the program can continue um, such that I have all those things as a pure functions. So you, you will notice that I don't have any IO in my interpreter. I only have pure functions here and any IO is delegated to a special run program IO routine, which deals with those uh, callbacks such that I, I can test everything and I can work with the pure functions for most of the language, you know, 99% of the language, uh, and only deal with those two cases, which is print and read in a separate context. Uh, and then the print and read are not tested. Like you cannot test them because they are using IO, uh, but you can test them, you know, in, in the REPL uh, if you want to. I didn't test it enough because I have a missing uh, end of line. I, I, I had originally print line and print, and I just got rid of print line, but print should behave as print line. So I need to add this uh, uh, end of line character to print. Uh, so that's pretty much it. Um, if you, if it's still something is unclear, uh, or if you still don't know what to do, then uh, post an issue in the issue tracker. Um, what is hard? Uh, the, this I.O. thing is a little bit hard, although once you know that you can jump out of the context and then continue, once you kind of work it out, then of course it's not hard. It's pretty simp simple, uh, but it took me a while to think about it. Like I initially started doing everything like the same in, in I.O. context, but then I realized you can't test it. Uh, so I kind of refactored it. Um, uh, and the second thing is dealing with quotations because those form a nested structures. Of course, you can have if statements inside if statements and you can have quotations inside quotations and you can have lists inside lists. And that re require you to think about recursive that data structures and how you evaluate in, how you evaluate things uh, such that, um, you know, it, it, it works. Um, but other than that, Almost everything here is very easy, uh, but it's quite a lot of things. So that's what I said. Like, it's not that it's hard, but it is, you need to be quite uh, organized and, and organize your program in such a way that you will not get lost, that the complexity will not eat you alive. Okay. Um, I don't have um, a lot of files. I have all my IO stuff in main. Uh, I have separate thing for all the interpreter routines. Uh, parser is separate and I defined all my types and I, I was very strict about identifying all the um, operations and all the types in such a way that I can reason about it using the language, in, in my case Haskell, uh, such as to make my life easier. Um, you will of course benefit from using either a lot, uh, such that I actually um, use the uh, the either package with some of the combinators for for either and as i said i'm using the state um monad with the uh, state t transformer uh, and you don't really need containers but for my uh for my variable bindings so if if you if you do this uh h10 definition thingy uh and you print your variable bindings i'm using a map so I'm, I'm using from the containers package, I'm using a map which has um, kind of a convenience methods for inserting and, and looking up uh, key value pairs. Uh, you can do the same with a list. Uh, you, you don't need to use the, the cont containers for it, but it, it just, as I said, like 
I try to make life easy everywhere I could such that everything becomes just a little bit easier uh, and, and the complexity do doesn't compound uh, because all the individual things are not very complex, but there is quite a lot of things that you need to keep track of and that can compound. All right, so that's all. Um, I hope it was somewhat helpful to clarify the, uh, the second assignment and then you will have as much fun with it as I had uh, and deal with the type system and with the co type coercions and type um, conversions the way you feel they should be done. And then in the readme file, motivate your choices. So motivate your choices for error handling, motivate your choices for the type system. Uh, the language is quite dynamic. Um, it doesn't have really proper type system, but certain things expect certain types and they don't work if that type is not provided. So uh, you will have to deal with some of the, of the questions here. All right, that's all. Good luck. And I'm looking forward to be checking your innovations in programming languages. Thanks.